Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muqtadar Khan, your host. And today I'm going to give you a briefing on the war that has just broken up. One of the fears of Joe Biden from the very beginning, since October 7th, when uh, Hamas uh, perpetrated those drastic terrorist attacks on Israel and killed and uh, raped and injured uh, uh, over 1,200 Israelis, uh, and then began Israel's six-month-long uh, genocidal war on Gaza, which has killed over 30,000, 32,000, uh, mostly civilians, mostly women and children, and completely devastated uh, two of the northern cities of Gaza. So this war has been going on for six months, and throughout this, one of the goals of President Joe Biden was to prevent an escalation and, sp and the spreading out of this war uh, into the rest of the Middle East, bringing in other countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Egypt. Uh, and it's uh, fair to say that today, Joe Biden's um, broad strategic goal in the Middle East has failed uh, as Iran, for the first time in an unprecedented attack, directly attacks Israel. This is from the Iranian soil to the Israeli soil, direct country-to-country -country attack. In the past, both countries have used proxies and intelligence agencies to attack each other's assets. Uh, but this is the first time where a warlike uh, action. In fact, this is war. If you look at the 200 drones and missiles that Iran has fired at Israel. So I want to provide, give you a briefing of this as to what is happening and also discuss some of the geopolitical and political implications uh, of this move. But before that, please subscribe to Conversations, like this video, press the bell icon so that you get not notified about uh, the future videos I do. This is my second video on Iran in the past three hours. Uh, and I will continue to cover this issue and provide you updates uh, and analysis uh, as and when necessary. Uh, and uh, so please don't forget to subscribe to Conversation and press the bell icon. Uh, do share this video with others also. So the first thing that I want to say is that this region has been war torn for too long and it needs peace. There has been too much warfare already in this world with the Russia-Ukraine war and now the Hamas-Israel war and now Iran-Israel. So I pray and wish that there is peace. I do hope that there is no further escalation, no widespread spread already in this one particular assault by Iran on Israel. Uh, four countries are involved. So Iran has attacked Israel and Iran's proxies in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen have also launched attacks in Israel. So it's basically uh, five Arab countries uh, attacking Israel. Uh, it's reminiscent of the last century. Uh, so we hope that this doesn't uh, break out into an all-out war because Israel is also not standing there alone. Israel is fighting with uh, the British Air Force is in action today, American Navy is in action, American intelligence, American satellites, America's technology, and also American missiles and uh, uh, drones, etc., are also working uh, over time uh, to protect Israel. Uh, so basically, it's like eight countries are already involved in this war, and I hope that it doesn't escalate. It's going to have a devastating impact on the economy. The price of oil could shoot up. It could undermine many of the developing economies which are coming out of uh, COVID and uh, Ukraine war-related uh, inflation. And if the cost of uh, oil goes through the roof, it is already over 90 after Israel attacked uh, the Iranian embassy in Damascus, Israel, uh, the oil price hit 90 and it, it could go above 120 uh, by tomorrow. So if that happens, it could undermine the economy of many developing nations and push them uh, in recession or force them to lose the gains that they have made in the past few months in terms of GDP growth uh, and job creation, etc. I see this as a major victory for Netanyahu and big defeat for Iran as well as the United States. For the last 20, 25 years, Netanyahu has been uh, trying his best to get Iran and the US to go to war. Iran is too big for Israel to handle by itself. And by provoking a war between US and Iran, it hopes that US will be able to enough damage uh, on Iran, perhaps even destroy its 
uh, developing nuclear capabilities, destroy its military industrial setup, uh, and push Iran 20, 30 years back. So its capacity to threaten Israel uh, is basically uh, eroded. That is what Israel hopes the U.S. can do. Israel doesn't have the capacity to do it. The U.S. has. So it is quite possible by attacking the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Directly, Israel has... Uh, uh, Netanyahu in particular may have achieved several strategic goals. One, uh, it could still bring the U.S. into direct conflict with Iran. Number two, what Israel has done is shifted, Netanyahu has shifted attention away from Gaza. Israel's brutal genocidal war, which devastated civilians and its civilian infrastructure, had essentially undermined Israel's uh, uh, image in the West and some of its closest allies were now stopping arms. Canada stopped selling arms to Israel. In the United States, there was demands that aid to Israel should be conditioned on its behavior. There was reluctance to send more financial aid to Israel. There's a lot of criticism of Israel, a lot more sympathy for Gazans, the Palestinians, more and more countries coming forward. Both Norway and Spain are going to go out and recognize the Palestinian state. So a lot of diplomatic defeats all around for Israel. Uh, and now suddenly this gives Israel an opportunity uh, by getting the West to unite against Iran, uh, a, a country that has been seen as a major troublemaker in the Middle East for the past 10 to 15 years, actually in the most of the century. Uh, United States Green Wars, Afghanistan and Iraq essentially empowered Iran and it has become a near hegemonic in the Middle East. So Israel, by triggering this bigger war, could achieve those goals that I just enumerated. But more than that, it gives Netanyahu a longer political lease. I don't think the Israeli population is going to be protesting against their prime minister as they have been doing for the past few weeks while missiles and drones are raining in on it and it's fighting for its very existence against Israel, uh, against uh, Iran and its uh, 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 proxies. So in that sense, it gives uh, Netanyahu another opportunity. There was a short period in which the, in Joe Biden, the president of the United States, was not even talking to Netanyahu. Now, once again, he's on the phone with Netanyahu, uh, reiterating America's ironclad uh, support for Israel. Now, this, this is for Israel very dangerous because in the past six months, we have seen a lot of unprecedented things happening. So for example, Hamas's attack was so successful that for several hours, Hamas fighters were running amok in Israel, killing and doing whatever they wanted. It showed the failure of Israeli intelligence, failure of US intelligence. It showed the failure of Israeli deterrence. Hamas was not scared of what Israel would retaliate with. It was also a failure of Israeli security. It could not protect its own population. Uh, the 1,200 for a small country is a huge uh, and devastating loss of life. And so in that sense, Israel had already experienced far many military defeats by the hands of Hamas. Uh, and then its uh, war and response from day one was completely like underwritten by the United States. From the very beginning, the U.S. US military generals were on the ground planning for a daily <laughs> weapons have been sent on a daily basis and Israel uh, was given weapons and resources by the United States. So it, it kind of underscored Israel's uh, huge dependency on the U.S. for its own security. So if you are an enemy of Israel in the Middle East, you're looking at this and saying, huh, Israel can't do anything on its own. It needs the United States to fight Hamas. It needs the United States and England to defend itself from Iran. So I think the, the image that Israel enjoyed, that it was invincible, has clearly been shattered. And now with the fact that Iran has dared to attack its soil, of course, the provocation came from Israel, but the fact that Iran is retaliating shows that uh, that that deterrence has also collapsed. Look, uh, 
This is very dangerous for Iran. Iran is not really as strong as most people think. Iran's economy is in a really bad shape. It's been suffering from sanctions for the last 40 years. It has already shared a lot of its uh, military uh, arsenal and given it to Russia, which, which is being used in Ukraine. So for Iran, this is not a good time for war, but Iran is in a tough place. If it doesn't respond to Israel's attack on Damascus, it looks weak. Uh, and it will lose leverage with some of its proxies, uh, and it will lose uh, the hegemonic influence it has in the Middle East. So for Israel pushed Iran in, in a position where it was either forced to uh, basically buckle down or to respond, and Iran has responded. Uh, the news is coming in that the Iranian uh, mission to the UN has says that as far as Iran is concerned, uh, it has concluded its military activity, which means there are no further attacks going to come uh, from Iran on Israel. Uh, so far, the reports are uh, that uh, the United States, uh, UK, the British Air Force, the American Navy, and the Israelis, and the Iron Dome that the US has provided to Israel have all succeeded uh, in kind of neutralizing all the nearly, nearly 200 drones and missiles that uh, were launched towards Israel. So there are not many significant casualties. Uh, Hezbollah did fire rockets at some military bases in Golan Heights. So, so, so there is not uh, uh, a major devastating uh, consequence to this attack that would force Israel to retaliate. But Israel will retaliate. It has to retaliate because it, if it needs to establish its deterrence. So we are caught in this vicious cycle where each nation will have to keep uh, escalating or at least responding. Uh, and so it's like playing a game of chicken. And so unless the United States can uh, impress upon Israel that, look, you attack them, they responded, it's all right, you killed 13 people, they haven't killed anybody, so you are coming out a winner, so let's put an end to this. But I'm not very sure that will happen. The American president did issue uh, a statement. Uh, and in the statement, let me say what the White House says. It says, earlier today, Iran and its proxies operating out of Yemen, Syria, and Iraq launched an unprecedented air attack against military facilities in Israel. I condemn this attack in the strongest possible terms. And then he goes on to say, this is thanks to our military. I have spoken to Prime Minister Netanyahu to affirm America's ironclad commitment. Etc. He says, tomorrow I will convene my fellow G7 leaders and coordinate a united diplomatic response to Iran's brazen attack. This is the key statement. So Biden is going to uh, respond to Iran's attack, not militarily, diplomatically. So you can expect uh, more sanctions, perhaps uh, more isolation of Iran, uh, and then big statements coming from G7, uh, etc. So basically, uh, it means that unless Israel decides to respond and attack Iran or its proxies, uh, there might be further escalation. One way to get out of this is that uh, Israel could just perhaps uh, attack Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon uh, and and then not give Iran or not force Iran in a position to respond again. So I think that's probably what could happen tomorrow. Uh, but this is uh, a big loss uh, for Iran if, if it is forced into uh, some kind of an exchange with the United States. It's going to be brutal. The U.S. will hurt Iran. It has done so before. Once before Iran, Iran's entire navy was destroyed by the U.S., uh, and uh, I don't think Iran wants to see a repeat of that. Uh, and for Biden, this is a lose, lose, lose situation. The Republicans are all over him. Donald Trump in his speech said this would not have happened if I was president. I mean, he claims that nothing would have happened if he was president. Uh, the Russia would not have attacked Ukraine. Hamas would not have attacked Israel. Iran would not have attacked Israel. So basically, he's saying that... The, Instead of saying that the United States and the U.S. Uh, so-called rule-based order, which the U.S. has completely destroyed in support for Ukraine and uh, and Israel, there are no rules anymore. It's, if anybody talks about rules or international norms or international law, just laugh on their face. Because just, just look at the case of Israel and every rule, every norm Israel has violated and the U.S. continues to, to support uh, it and undermine the international system. So... 
so basically, the U.S. under Biden has definitely weakened the international uh, rule-based order. But also, what Trump is saying is that's not the case. It's only Biden who is weak, not the U.S. If he was president, then well, like he's not talking about rule-based order. He's basically saying that they would be afraid of me and uh, the powerful United States, and they would all behave because if they didn't behave, I don't know what Trump would do. Maybe he would take out uh, something from his uh, playbook with his playgirls and spank people around. Uh, I don't know what he would do, but nevertheless, the Republicans are all over Biden. If the price of oil goes up already, if you look at newspapers yesterday and day before yesterday, you would notice that there's a lot of talk about inflation in the United States and that uh, the, the central bank in the US is not going to uh, bring down the, the insurance rates because inflation is rising. And if the price of oil goes up tomorrow, then you can see inflation rising all over the world. Europe will also suffer. US will also suffer. The global south will suffer. And Biden will suffer if things become expensive in the United States. Already people are talking about the, the fact that one of his weaknesses is his inability to handle the economy. And if the economy goes strong, because uh, becomes weaker with inflation becoming stronger uh, because of Biden's foreign policy. He failed to stop the expansion of the war, period. He, he's, every goal that he set in the beginning has failed, uh, partly because Netanyahu will not listen to him and he does not have the guts to use whatever leverage is available to the president of the United States. Uh, and so it is quite possible that uh, that uh, Biden will come out once again a loser as a result of this new development in the uh, Israel-Arab uh, saga that has been going on for the past six, seven months. One more point that is that uh, if you have noticed that uh, the, the uncommitted, I mean, the domestic resistance to Biden and displeasure with Biden's foreign policy uh, among Muslims, among Arabs, among progressive, among young people, that has not diminished at all. Uh, and if Biden were to go to war with Iran, God forbid, if a few Americans die as a result of that, that is the end of Joe Biden's political career, I can tell you that much. Uh, so I don't think Joe Biden is going to try and get into a direct uh, confrontation with Iran. He may defend Israel using American weapons, missiles, rockets, but I don't think he's going to target Iranian because one Houthi missile hits a boat somewhere and America's president will lose elections in November. That I'm very sure of, that a war will have such a damaging impact on Joe Biden's political career. So these are some of the points I wanted to share with you. Uh, remain tuned in. I will come back to you again. For those of you who are watching from India, I have a Hindi version of this already up. I will also be on some Hindi YouTube channels. You can just Google them uh, and uh, you will see me there talking uh, about this unprecedented development in the Middle East in Hindi language too. So until the next briefing, uh, be safe, uh, continue to watch conversations, uh, like this video, press the bell icon and do everything uh, that YouTubers want you to do. So take care. Thank you very much. I'm Muhtadar Khan, your host. Thanks for watching.